this is Stephanie Ruper. Thank you so much for tuning into the Naked Humanity podcast, where we take a deep, deep dive into what it means to be human in the modern world. Today is episode number 53, and I have on Dr. Hannah McGregor, who is a specialist in feminism and the ways in which it relates to uh, publishing in academia and in trade presses. I'm really glad I got that whole mouthful out. Hannah McGregor is a fantastic guest. She is a very prolific podcaster, a very uh, successful podcaster in the sense that her podcasts are fantastic. She hosts a podcast called Secret Feminist Agenda that I highly recommend checking out if you are into or if you are not into feminism. It's a great place to learn about these conversations that are going on and about how uh, people are impacted and influenced and behaving and all these sorts of things. Uh, in a feminist perspective, I love, love, love the podcast. I actually had the idea to host uh, Hannah on this show because somebody in this community reached out to me and told me that they loved her work and that it was something that I would probably uh, really resonate with. And so I did. I reached out to Hannah immediately and uh, I'm, I'm so glad that I did. We just uh, finished chatting and this conversation was actually very edifying for me. I, I say that often, it's true often, uh, but this has helped me rethink uh, the ways in which progressive feminist ideas, uh, we talk about uh, discourses on ableism and classism and racism, I and mean, it really got me thinking about how these conversations uh, happen and where we should be you know, putting our ears to the ground, so to speak, where we should be listening, how we should be listening. Uh, it's a fantastic conversation. Hannah also talks about uh, her experiences as a as a white woman getting uh, upset, uh, going through airport security, and sort of learning about herself and white womanhood and, and what that means and why that's an idea that's important to think about. So I'm a big, big, big fan of this conversation. I'm a big fan of Hannah's. Uh, I think that you will really, really enjoy it. I have uh, been looking actually for quite some time. We're now in the 50s of Naked Humanity, and I have been very much wanting to have somebody actively thinking about, you know, critically um, and passionately about about these questions on the podcast for some time, and and, and it took me a while, and I I do regret that, of course. I'll, although these kinds of ideas and in, in feminism and, and what have you have been laced throughout the podcast, we actually this is the first episode on it directly, and I think really does uh, the topic justice. So I'm really excited about it. I'll read you a bit about Hannah. She does a lot of um, and has done many fantastic things. So here we go. Hannah McGregor is an assistant professor in publishing at Simon Fraser University, that's in Canada, where her research and teaching focuses on the links between publishing and social change and the role podcasts might play in expanding public engagement with research to systemic barriers to access in the Canadian publishing industry. Hannah completed her PhD at Trans Canada Institute at the University of Guelph in 2013 where her research focused on contemporary white Canadian women's representations of distant suffering. She held the SSHRC postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Alberta. Her project, Modern Magazines Project Canada, was a collaborative initiative that took up the call to read magazines as a form of new media technology. In collaboration with the University of Alberta Libraries and the Manitoba Legislative Library, she helped to facilitate the digitization of the full run of the Winnipeg-based magazine, The Western Home Monthly, her research has been working with many related topics over the course of the last few years. She currently hosts the Secret Feminist Agenda podcast and is working with, uh, she once hosted a podcast, which we talk about briefly here in this podcast uh, called Witch Please. It's about feminism and Harry Potter. Uh, very exciting. Um, and I do so highly recommend checking out her work. She also is working um, as a part of a group to introduce peer review to podcasting, which is very interesting. Podcasting as a form of academic engagement. I think that that's really cool and something that we'll think really critically about uh, here in our podcasting work. So I rambled on enough. I really want to get to this amazing content. And as a fantastic guest, please do check out her work. I've got links in the show notes her secret feminist agenda and her on Twitter. And you can, of course, always get at me, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Stephanie Ruper. You know where to find me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Here is Dr. Hannah McGregor. 
So welcome, Hannah. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi. I'm great. I was just telling you uh, how excited I am to have you on. And I've actually uh, been talking about that quite a bit on social media that I've been uh, dying to have somebody who is sort of at this really cool intersection of uh, feminism and media space and the academy and stuff. So uh, yeah, you're perfect. And thanks. Great. Great. I'm delighted to be here. (laughs) Uh, So maybe we could get started and you could just uh, tell us a little bit about what you do because I've read a lot about it, but there's there's a lot there, so I would love yeah. to hear it in your own words. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I'm primarily, I've been trying really hard recently to figure out a way to, in one sentence, describe oh, good what research I do, which yeah. is really hard, but I have decided my current like one sentence description is that I work on feminist interventions into both trade and scholarly publishing. So there you go, feminism and publishing and where they intersect. And that looks like a lot of different things in my work. Like I do historical research on the history of Middle Brown Magazine publishing in Canada. Like I do a bunch of different things that sort of articulate that in different ways. Uh, My main field of research right now, however, is about using podcasting as a non-traditional form of scholarly communication that I think gives us an exciting space of feminist intervention into the kinds of norms of how we usually communicate our work as scholars. So many questions. So <laughs> what is it about this? Uh, what, so what is it about this intervention that makes it feminist? Yeah. So I don't want to claim, I would never claim that podcasting is an inherently feminist medium. In fact, like a lot of techy corners of the internet. It has historically been dominated by white men and women have had a lot of trouble breaking into podcasting for a variety of reasons, including the way that as podcasting gets professionalized, it's increasingly gatekept and the gatekeepers are all white men. And then also the historical distaste people have for women's voices. (laughs) People don't like what we sound like. People often say to me, like, I don't like listening to women's podcasts, but yours is okay. And I'm like, thanks. (laughs) Which is a bad compliment because complimenting a woman via misogyny is never good. It doesn't work. Like, I usually hate women, but you're different is like, "Mm, thank you, but no. I will say no thank you to that that compliment. Um, Yeah, so podcasting, I don't think, has anything inherently feminist about it. But I do think that... Podcasting provides us a space where we can intervene, like I was saying, into the norms of how scholarly communication happens. And by that, I mean both the uh, normal ways we think about the publishing process. So um, that scholarship is published usually in paywalled, closed off, hard to access venues, um, that uh, it's difficult to make work timely, relatable, or community accountable because of the slowness of the scholarly publishing process and often mm-hmm. because of the um, the long and tortured process of peer review, which many of us have been through. And so people often don't know where to find our work. People often don't see, don't understand the relevance of our work. There's also something though for me about podcasting as a fundamentally embodied medium. You can hear my voice, you can hear my emotional response to stuff, and as in many ways a fundamentally conversational medium in which lots of different perspectives can come together in the space of the podcast. And I think those, the sort of embodied, um, the, the putting the body back into scholarship and making scholarship into a dialogue are both already established feminist interventions. This is work that feminists have been doing for a long time in terms of unsettling the status quo of sort of what we think scholarship should sound like. And I think podcasting is a good match for that kind of work. Mm. I, I agree with you. And I, kind of, I suspected that that was kind of what you were going to say. I, but I personally find so fascinating that there were certain like words that I thought that you might say that you did say like embodiment and dialogue or conversation or what have you. And this is something that I have learned. So I grew up in a home, like I grew up calling feminists feminazis, right? So I was culture. Yeah. Well, I was cultured into a world that just wasn't really into the thing. And it wasn't until my mid twenties that I like took feminism seriously. 
And, but then like, I, I sort of un- came to understand it and studied it and how we talk about it in like the popular discourse, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't until I did my PhD that I learned that there's this like huge, like, bo- like, you know, flood of all these different ways that feminism like acts within the world and Mm -hmm. this thing of like question, just like questioning the dominant way of doing things is really central. And these ideas of like putting ourselves back in our bodies are also very central. And I, I just, I find it so fascinating that those, those ideas from feminism are so prevalent in the Academy, but not at all, you know, it's, it's, you don't really find that on Twitter, for example. Um, At least not. It depends on your Twitter. (laughs) <laughs> it depends on your Twitter, but but I don't think it's like it's not it's not everywhere on your Twitter. Um, so I'm wondering if you like if you could tell us a little bit about the ways in which feminism like functions in the academy to change how we do and look at the world. Like very generally speaking, you know, you mentioned embodiment and some other things like that. Yeah, yeah. So I actually don't think that these really key interventions come out of the academy. I think that these key interventions come out of radical and minoritized communities, find their way into the academy, are legitimized and mainstreamed in some ways by academic discourse, I think particularly via students, um, and then make their way back out into the world. So I think that for a lot of young people going to universities, so we might talk about like white and middle class young people, for example, um, the academy might be the first place that they encounter certain forms of radical thought, but that those forms of radical thought didn't come from the academy. They were just picked up and circulated in particular ways via the university and the really central position that it plays in some demographics lives and in some demographics educations. But the things that I know about feminism, the things that I learn about feminism actually really rarely come from scholarship. They come sometimes from conversations with other feminist scholars. Um, And I don't want to say that important work's not happening in the university, but I think you look to like who I consider to be one of the most important feminist thinkers of the moment, Sarah Ahmed, who certainly was working within the university, but who understands her work as functioning outside of it and has left the academy for exactly that reason and is very engaged in Um, tracing these histories of feminist work. She says at the beginning of living a feminist life that the space of feminism is not the university. The space of feminism is the home. Feminism happens around the dinner table when a feminist turns to somebody and says, that's not funny. That's the work of feminism. When, Mm -hmm. you know, you're at Thanksgiving dinner with your uncle and he makes a rape joke and you turn to him and say, I actually don't think that's funny and I would really rather you didn't say that. That's feminism, right? So that's not that that's not coming out of the academy. That's coming out of people's lived experiences. Mm. But this language of, you know, embodiment, for example, the insistence of placing ourselves back into our bodies, this is work that comes from black and indigenous feminists who have historically been kept out of the academy. <laughs> so yeah, so I think, however, that while we can recognize that the university is often not where these ideas are coming from, that the university can nonetheless have a really useful function of amplification and circulation. Mm -hmm. That even though it's often talked about as being this detached ivory tower that has nothing to do with people's lives, in fact, a lot of people encounter the university at some point in in their lives. And we have a lot of access to different ways of sort of mobilizing and circulating and activating the ideas that we're interested in that, that I think we could, you know, hypothetically all get more excited about. Yeah, I thank you. That's really helpful. Do you have ideas then, you know, talking about these circulating things? And I am uh, a number of things. One, uh, Sarah Ahmed, Ahmed's work has also been super influential for me, and I had no idea she left the Academy, so I should check up on things she's been doing since. Yep. Um, that's so cool. Uh, B, so in these conversations where they, you know, we're sort of churning through, how do we, right? So I live, I have historically lived in these communities and I, I find that even now, right, having spent much, spent a lot of time uh, living in various cities in different parts of the world, um, it's still like, I'm not very 
tangential to unless I actively seek out a lot of these discourses that might teach me things that are readily apparent in Native and Indigenous communities and the like. So how do we bridge these gaps, right? How do we sort of get these pools of thought or like Twitter streams um, to, to be a little bit more convergent? Because like you said, like I, I love that the Academy is amplifying was your yeah. word, which I really like. I love the amplifying, uh, but I still feel like there's, there's a, there's a big distance. Is there not? Mm. There can be. And there are lots of really interesting ways of narrowing those distances. I, so I moved to Vancouver three years ago to start a job here at Simon Fraser university. And my social organization changed a lot when I moved here, which is to say, Prior to this, I'd been a graduate student or a postdoc or a sessional for a decade, and all of my community was academics. Mm -hmm. That's who I spent all of my time with. I was so inside the world of the university. And when I moved here, I work work as part of a large university, but at a very small downtown campus, which is like a 45-minute bus ride away from the main university. I work in a tiny department, and I didn't know anybody when I moved here. And I ended up making almost exclusively non-academic friends. And that has been a really important reminder for me that conversations about feminism, about social change and social justice, about systemic racism, about environmental crisis, about trans rights, like the conversations that I think sometimes get dismissed as being academic conversations are urgently, vitally, passionately unfolding across all kinds of different communities. So that's my like advice to academics in general is make friends outside of the university because it will really change your sense of how ideas and communities and thought and action centers in the university. And then the other thing is I do think that that reading is our best tool for exposing ourselves ourselves to ideas and that in part is going to be, yeah, like Twitter is a place I encounter a lot of really challenging thought. I follow a lot of Black and Indigenous activists who are not necessarily academics, and I try to learn from them, and I try in particular to sort of spend time when they are talking about things that I don't understand to take the time and be like, okay, what's going on here? I'm going to go try to find out more about this. I'm going to give this a Google and learn more. But then I also just try to read the work that's being written by community embedded activist oriented radical thinkers because they are publishing books they're not publishing books with penguin random house they're not publishing books with university presses you've got to but a part of that sort of new way i relate to space and community since i moved here has also been a lot of the people that i know now work for independent presses and so i've got a much better sense of like the ideas that are coming out of these Mm -hmm. these independent publishing sites. So like I follow very closely the work of this Vancouver press called Arsenal Pulp Press, which is this historically social justice oriented press that publishes like amazing radical work by like gender non-conforming like trans people of color disability activists who are writing these amazing essay manifestos that are like so fucking transformative and incredible that they make anything that we have to say in the university just look tepid. Tepid is a good word. That's, yeah. that's accurate. That's very nice. Um, okay, cool. So your own work, can, mm-hmm. can you tell us a little bit about how secret feminist agenda sort of fits into this picture. Yeah. So that, it it very much ties into what I was just talking about, about that desire to be listening to and learning from other feminists, um, feminists doing work that I'm not familiar with that is going to challenge me, expand my thinking. Um, And so I was a year into my time here in Vancouver and I'd already made a podcast. I made a uh, feminist Harry Potter podcast called Witch Please with a friend and colleague at the University of Alberta. And that was winding down as a project. We had read all the books and talked about all the movies, so we didn't have much left to do. (laughs) And I was feeling a need to, to figure out ways to build that feminist community that I always really hunger for. And so I came up with Secret Feminist Agenda as 
just a space in which to have conversations with other feminists about whatever was on their minds, whatever aspect of feminism they were currently thinking through. So the first episode I ever made was with my friend Zain. We sat down on a park bench and I was like, all right, Zain, what have you been thinking about in regards to feminism? And Zain was like, I have been thinking a lot about femme presentation and makeup skills and the way that those are uh, dismissed as frivolous. And I want to think about the way that um, sort of femme skills are serious skills and what it means to, to think of the work that we do as serious, even or maybe especially when other people are telling us that it's silly. And that was the first conversation that was like, yeah, okay, we're going to do this. We're like, I'm just going to sit down with feminists and be like, all right, let's talk. And that has been such a vital form of learning for me over the years that I have done the podcast is that opportunity to sit down with people and be like, all right, what do you think? And then people tell me and I'm like, oh shit, yeah. Wow, that's a really different way of thinking about this idea. Or that's something I'd never thought about before. It's such an exciting space for me um, to, to expand just the way that I relate to the world. And so I started Secret Feminist Agenda purely as a passion project. And at the same time, I was putting together a project working with a scholarly press here in Canada, Wilfrid Laurier University Press, that was proposing that we could peer review podcasts. And what I had originally pitched as part of that project was that I was going to do a short run podcast, I think on fan studies, on critical fandom studies, because I had been working on this Harry Potter project and I was sort of in that headspace. And then I started Secret Feminist Agenda. And then a couple of months later, I was talking to my collaborator at the press and was like, all right, so I'm starting to think about what my podcast for our project might be. And she was like, isn't it Secret Feminist Agenda? And I was like, no, that's not scholarly. Don't be silly. We can't peer review that. It's just ladies talking. It's not always ladies, but you know, um, it, it didn't feel, it, it wasn't what I had imagined as being my first foray into scholarly publishing. And Siobhan really had to push me on recognizing that what was happening there was a form of scholarship. And that combination of simultaneously having these conversations that feel transformative, and then also really pushing myself to recognize that transformative conversations with other feminists is a form of scholarship, have has collectively really shifted my sense of what we can do in the name of scholarship. Mm. Yeah, I, as I mentioned you previously, it, it hadn't really occurred to me. I think that uh, that's a really fascinating idea and this conversation, you know, and looking into your secret feminist agenda stuff has really sort of pushed me to think about scholarly materials. And I personally have always felt like academic publishing needs to change like really drastically, right? Um, and this, this would just be like, again, another important way of, of sort of breaking down these barriers and deconstructing these preconceptions we have about like what it means, like, quote unquote, to be smart. You know, yeah. I, I had a friend say to me yesterday, like, well, if you want to be surrounded by like, if you want to be friends with smart people for the rest of your life, you have to like stay in Oxford. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. And he meant like people who are embedded in certain discourses about ethics or epistemology or whatever. And I like, sure, I get that, you know, like the training, the specific academic training. But yeah, yeah, no. That's really the tautological though, right? It's like, well, if you want to keep having the specific kinds of conversations we value at Oxford, you have to stay at Oxford. Like, well, duh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah pre obviously. precisely. Um, but, I, you know, I... I have been seeking ways to sort of deconstruct these things. Um, so I'm, I'm deeply, deeply appreciative of that. Is there anything that you have done? Anything? I know you mentioned your first episode, but are there any sort of personal revelations you've had or major changes in the way that you sort of relate to the concept of feminism since starting the podcast? Yeah, the big opening out for me has been um, disability justice and learning about disability justice and really starting to incorporate that thinking into my feminism. I was already quite engaged with critical race feminism um, prior to starting working on Secret Feminist Agenda. And so I've learned a lot of really 
specific things and really grappled with, like had more space and time to grapple with um, whiteness and my relationship to whiteness and whiteness as a form of violence. Like that is thinking that has been pushed forward for me, but the disability justice work has like exploded my brain outwards in all kinds of absolutely incredible ways. So the, the author I was referencing previously who's published by Arsenal is Leah Lakshmi Pieps Nasamaracina, who has this amazing essay collection called Care Work, Dreaming Disability Justice. That was so transformative, like so fundamentally transformative. But in a lot of ways, that thinking in the podcast happened with a, started with a really early episode where I talked to Sonera Geisler, who is actually the marketing manager at Arsenal Pulp Press. And she was like, cool, let's talk about our obsessive fixation on equating our value as people with our productivity. And what would it look like to say, I have value as a person if I never accomplish another thing in my life. And can you actually, can you actually think that and believe it? And if not, why not? And how much is ableism embedded in that? That our capacity to produce within particular norms is synonymous with our value as human beings. And I have really been realizing the degree to which engaging with disability justice is like going to set us all free. <laughs> like it really is. It really, like we are killing ourselves with under late capitalism. I mean, late capitalism is, is teaching us all to kill ourselves. Um, and we actually don't have to, and we can actually collectively dream a different world where we actually don't think that our value is equated with our productivity. And that was just still continues to be such a radical and exciting idea for me. And it's transformed how I relate to friends and family who are disabled and chronically ill. It's really changed how I relate to my students. It's really changed how I run my classroom, how I challenge my own sort of ideas about what students are expected to produce and how students are expected to behave in the space of a classroom and really coming to understand that like, okay, this is an institution, the university in general is an institution that is built on whiteness and able-bodiedness and wealth. And all of the norms about classroom behavior are norms that were designed to privilege the participation of white, able-bodied, wealthy people. And if we continue to treat those norms as normal and say, yeah, 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 I'm a cool professor, but obviously if you're two minutes late, you lose marks. Like otherwise we'd have chaos. Like if you continue to normalize those classroom policies, then you're saying, yeah, I would actually like this institution to still only be for rich, white, able-bodied people. And I, I don't want that. And that means I've had to change how I do a lot of my work. In what ways? I mean, in terms of how I design my classrooms, in terms of, I had this real moment, <laughs> I think last year, when a student came to me and they were like, I've had a really hard semester. I've fallen behind on all of my work. Is there anything I can do? And it was a situation where normally I would have said like, yeah, okay, you know, I'll let you make this thing up, but like, you've got to have a late penalty because otherwise it's unfair to other students. And I had this moment where I was like, late penalties aren't real. The syllabus isn't real. None of this is real. I just invented all of it. I can treat this human being however I want to treat this human being. So why don't I treat them compassionately? Isn't that better? Literally, what would I gain from punishing them? Like what, what they won't learn better. I don't get a fucking prize. I'm sorry, I hope the swearing's okay, but otherwise you can just bleep it out. I don't get a prize at the end of the semester for how many students I made cry. Like I just... And that's what it keeps happening. Like I was in class last week and I told my students, you know, I was giving them time to put themselves into um, four person groups for their final project. And there was this like big group of students who all, were all sort of standing in a circle and, and talking through ideas together. And then they were like, well, we all have one idea we want to do together. And there's 20 of us. And I was like, yeah, you can't do a 20 person project. That's going to be unwieldy. Break your idea down into sub segments and then think about, you know, who wants to work on what. And they, so they did some more of that. And then they turned to me and they were like, ah, is it okay if we have some groups of three and some groups of five instead of groups of four? 
And I opened my mouth to be like, no, I said groups of four. And then I was like, that was arbitrary. <laughs> there's a, there's nothing, there's no reason it should be groups of four rather than groups of three and five. And I was like, yeah, go ahead. Like, and so I just keep catching myself in that way that like, yeah, there are things that we put in place and structures we put in place that like allow us to run a classroom, right? Like just total, I mean, total anarchy would make things hard in some ways. We're working within institutions that have rules and expectations, but like, how often are you employing rules, following the status quo, internalizing these ideas of like, oh, this has to be done this way because it's the way things are done. You know, I have to write this way because this is how academics write. I have to do this work because this is what academics do. And the university is full of this. The university is a site of unspoken rules and tacit knowledges. And that, it runs that way deliberately, both because it can extract a massive amount of labor out of us by never telling us exactly how much we're supposed to be doing, which is a great scheme. <laughs> be like, never tell people if they've done enough and then they'll work forever. And that also because then it, it privileges the participation of people who have access to that tacit knowledge. And that's, mm-hmm. you know, a great way of maintaining the status quo. But like, we don't have to keep doing that. We could just, we can just stop. Wild. Wild. Yeah, I, um, I have personally uh, struggled a fair bit with my education because I have chronic migraines, intense migraines, and have played by those rules, right? And oh. so intensely regulated, right? It is a enormous emotional and mental and physical labor to be on the end of trying to fit into those roles. But it is, on the other hand, it is a massive task of ours to try to figure out how we can be, again, maintaining structures, but at the same time, taking care of everybody in ways that are, you know, just and fair and compassionate yeah. and the like, you know, really yeah. big. Yeah. And there are, there are questions to be asked there, right? Like, um, uh, Leah writes in their book about things working on disabled time which is that when you are working with people who are disabled, you know, somebody might have a migraine and not be able to show up. Somebody might not like, cause you don't know because disability um, and capitalism don't get along. <laughs> and I think, I think disability should win. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think we should let capitalism determine people's value, but that can present organizing challenges. It can present um, like institutional challenges. And, and I'm, I don't think anybody would claim that those aren't going to be tricky to figure out how to navigate and figure out how we can redesign these systems. But if we start from a green, that is, it is a problem that a person with a chronic illness or a disability has to expend endless amounts of emotional energy trying to fit themselves into a system that wasn't made for them. Like, like let's start, let's agree that that's not okay and then go from there. Right. And I think a a problem that we have in these discourses or conversations about feminism and ableism and however we want to categorize these, you know, discourses Mm -hmm. um, is that they often seem, they may seem in a simplified form to be saying like, you must do X thing or you're not a good person or or whatever. Whereas uh, I think a better characterization of the approach might be like, let's ask these questions and see how we can respond to them in the way that has the most, you know, accountability and, and care or what have you. You know, it's just, it's, it's, I don't know what to do about this problem that these question asking endeavors end up seeming like they're making accusations or something. It's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it really is. I mean, people go very quickly sometimes when they're asked to care about something they go very quickly to like, oh, well, but what about this really precise scenario in which caring about that thing would be an inconvenience? Mm. And I think trying really hard to pull the conversations back and say like, okay, no, 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 let's not get there yet. Let's care first. Like let, let's actually really, because caring is not easy. It's, it, it's work and it involves learning and it involves shifting your sense of the world. So care first, like work first on caring, and then we can move to collectively coming up with solutions. Um, mm-hmm. But we, we switch so quickly sometimes into the mode of like, 
like playing out really particular scenarios and then and then pointing out problems and it's like I love that I love that so much I um I actually had a woman come on the podcast 10 episodes ago or what have you who identifies as a free market capitalist and as a feminist and while I understand that these categories to many people seem deeply antithetical what I see grounding these two approaches is like I care very deeply about these marginalized groups. You know, I care very deeply about what's happening in Flint. I care very deeply about, you know, all of these different issues. And I want to be having conversations about them, but I also have this background and this interest in economics and this view or what have you, right? And I I see no problem with that because these are humans, all these are humans who care and who want to be having conversations about this. And I just wouldn't it be nice, right, if we could like you know, sure, maybe we need to deconstruct capitalism in a different way, but that's something that we can talk about. And all we really need to be doing is caring and willing to like talk to people about it, you know? Yeah. 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 And I, I, I do obviously personally think that if you are, if you care and are being attentive to what is happening in the world, you will eventually come to the conclusion that capitalism is killing us all. Um, But you're never going to get there. You're never going to shift, like none of us are ever going to shift our thinking productively from a place that isn't like some, and now I was, sorry, the end of that sentence, that isn't care. And then I also want to say care is weaponized by white women in a ton of ways. Care is not, I, it can't be the sort of cure all um, because it's got to be for me like politically engaged care that is prioritizes like actually listening to people Mm -hmm. right because otherwise we turn very quickly into this sort of paternalistic like I know what's best for you I care and so I'm going to tell you what you need instead of listening to you and that is a thing that we see all the way through like the history of the way that white women move in the world it's like this sort of paternalistic colonialist white supremacist notion that like you know I I care and so nothing (laughs) I do can be wrong so maybe this is a good moment to talk about the importance of intersections of of race and and gender and and class and what have you Mm -hmm. um, because I do think there are a lot of people out there who who care very deeply right and who listen to this podcast and who listen to all the podcasts or what have you um but in failing to deconstruct our own positions of power perhaps because we are disadvantaged in certain ways right it's, it's easy to be blinded by a particular a particular thread. And so can you just talk a little bit about like why intersectionality, you know, yeah. or whatever language you want to use, like why that matters. Yeah. Can I start with my little soapbox moment, the history of intersectionality? Yeah. So um, uh, intersectionality came from a legal scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw, coined the term intersectionality, um, specifically to talk about a legal case. Do you know this already? I uh, really footnotes. So yeah. you go ahead. Yeah. So the legal case that she was looking at was a case in which I believe it was an automotive factory, though I might be getting the details wrong, but it was a factory space in which there was a factory floor and then an office. So there was two different sites of labor and in the factory floor, the company would hire black men to work. And in the office, the company would hire white women to work but they would not hire black women to work in either the factory or in the office. They couldn't work in the office because they were black. They couldn't work in the factory because they were women. But the women could not sue, these black women could not sue this company around any of the sort of currently existing labor laws and protections because the company was not, not discriminating against women and not discriminating against black people because there was no legal category to recognize that blackness and womanhood, when they intersect, produce a very specific legal category that experiences very specific forms of labor discrimination in this case. And I think the term gets bandied about a lot very loosely, but what it is trying to get us to pay attention to is the way that none of us fit easily or comfortably into singular categories of identity and that we are all navigating and negotiating multiple ways of being in the world all the time and that the particular ways that our identities, different categories of identity intersect, produce unique experiences, right? And so we can talk about like, I am 
a white cis woman who is also queer. So let's talk about where my cisness and my queerness intersect in my identity and and where that has been intersecting a lot right now is around some really heated conversations. I know you've got the shit in the UK too. Some really heated conversations around transphobia and um, a certain demographic of queer women who want to claim that trans women are not women and who are trying to root that claim in their own queerness and in this particular history of like lesbian separatism um, and uh, knowing like the way that I relate to what is happening in these moments, the way I feel about them, the way that I can and cannot speak to them is really precise to the fact that I am both a cis woman and a queer person. And that places me in that conversation in a really specific way. And yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Um, I think that that's really interesting and and very important because when we talk about intersectionality and identity politics, understanding the world through lenses of race and and class and what have you, um, I think that there's a real fear that the discourse is trying to put people in in boxes, right? And say, well, you're in this box and you're in this box and you get these privileges and you need these privileges. But to understand that the discourse is actually sort of trying to deconstruct boxes and say, actually, things are really complicated. That's trying to really let us important. Out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, my recent sort of personal encounter with, uh, encounter is the wrong word, but like my personal deployment of intersectional thinking recently has been, um, I love these sort of political and theoretical conversations are my favorite when the tools that I have learned from them actually help me understand something that's happening in my own life, which happens all the time. Sure. So I had noticed around a year ago that I was starting to get really snippy with employees at airports. I find air travel really stressful and I particularly find the experience of people arbitrarily using their institutional power to punish me and to make me do things that don't make any sense. I find that infuriating. And I was starting to respond by getting rude. And one day I could just fucking hear in my voice that middle-class white lady asking to speak to a manager. Like I hear she was coming out of my throat and I was like, oh, where, sh- where did she come from? <laughs> she is me. me. <laughs> Why is she, who, what's happened? And so I like sat with that. I was like, okay, you know, what is, what am I getting stressed about? Why am I behaving this way? What is going on? And I came up with this theory about white, wi- why white women are like that. Why we, um, particularly in these experiences where we are frustrated while engaging with people in sort of customer service positions, why we, we behave this way. And I was like, okay, this is something that is produced very specifically by the intersection of femininity and whiteness. Because on the one hand, we are fucking exhausted from constant microaggressions, from being constantly belittled, from being treated like children all the time, from being, I was at a a reading last week that was being sponsored by my department. And when I tried to get into the reading, the usher, who was an older man, wouldn't let me. He turned to a male colleague of mine and asked his permission to let me into the reading. He said, one sec, I just need to ask your boss. Like, it's that, right? You just get so fucking exhausted from that. Nobody treats me like an adult. Nobody treats me like a real person. I am always a half human who people are like, oh, what man owns her? And that, like that, the way that wears on you and then take that wearing and combine it with the fact that I know that if I treat an employee like shit, nobody's calling the cops on me. If I am rude at an airport, I'm not going to get detained for 10 hours with my cell phone taken away from me. I'm not going to have my human rights violated. I know the state loves me. The state is designed to protect me. So I am simultaneously exhausted and worn down from being infantilized 
and totally comfortable with my power via my whiteness. And the intersection of those two experiences turns me into somebody who's fucking rude to people who are working at airports. And that, like that, that revelation for me was like, oh, okay, I can stop doing this now. Like Mm -hmm. I understand why I'm doing this and I can be like, okay, this person is being rude to me, but this, this is an entirely inappropriate response to it that is rooted in my sense of my privilege and my right to treat people however I want. So like, okay. And for me, once I understand things like that, like that becomes a really good tool for me to be like, okay, I can stop. Right. And like, talk about being in roles that are stressful, right? Like I have never seen an airport employee, you know, a security employee, just like not up to the, up to their ears and things that are really stressful. Like It's such a stressful job. It's, it's an incredibly stressful job. Right? Like they're yeah. just a human being who is doing their best. It, it, yeah. Like it's so, it's so entirely the same thing. Yeah. Like, you know, you're watching white ladies scream at baristas and it's like, okay, yeah, you are, something is happening here. And the thing that is happening is a, an abuse of power that is rooted in whiteness. And the thing that is happening is also very likely a sort of real frustration that, is re- that comes out of something hard that is happening in that person's life. And I think that that comes back to your point about like people are like, well, I can't possibly be in a privileged position because I experience suffering in some way. And it's like, yeah, you know what? We all do. It is hard being a human in the world. Like it really genuinely is. And it's hard for different people in all kinds of ways. Like I look at my brother who is a white cis straight man. Um, we, uh, our mother died when we were 16 and I had immediately a community of other young women who I could talk to about that and have continued to have a community of people that I could talk to and process my trauma and as a result, have figured out how to be a functioning adult in the world. And I am not convinced he has ever had a conversation with anybody about what happened. Because white masculinity means that you are not allowed to have feelings. And that fucking breaks people. Like, that mm-hmm. is a horrifying thing to happen to people. So, like, yeah, the world is, is really hard in a lot of different ways for a lot of different people. And trying to figure out how to, like, untangle how those different forces are working in you... I think it's like our best case study for understanding how these different systems work. And, and like I said, like it really starts to set us all free when we actually do the work of thinking like, okay, like what is working on me right now and how can I understand it better? I love that. Are, are you going to, have you written about the, the, your experience at the airport? I feel like that could be so Yeah, powerful. yeah, yeah. It's in, it's in, I haven't figured out where to put it yet but I'm writing a book right now on um, feminist methods, rethinking the idea of feminist method. Um, And I think it might fit. I have an essay in there about bitchiness. Um, And I think it might have space somewhere in that essay on bitchiness. Um, Wow. I I can't wait to read that essay. Um, Yeah. That's so wonderful. And I I think you're so, so right about this. And it also, I think makes the ideas a little bit less, again, like a little bit more approachable, a little bit less Mm -hmm. something to defend yourself against, because all we're literally doing is being like, okay, what's affecting me? How is it affecting me? How can I react to it in a way that is not, you know, productive for me and for other humans and notice my capital language, my capitalist language, productive, but like how (laughs) in a way that most greases the wheels of industry. (laughs) Exactly. Um, so so maybe not productive for me, but like, you know, helps me, helps other people. It's, it's good for us. Um, it's like literally, you you know, how, how can you say no to that? Right. Yeah. I mean, doesn't it sound great? It sounds Um, great, but it does, it does mean change, you know, and it does mean self-interrogation and those are, not easy either. No, no, they're not. And it is work. And it is the sort of the hardest moments for me generally in doing this work are the moments when I get involved as an ally around some activism, get so fucking exhausted and burnt out and hurt in the process because activism is exhausting and hard. And then have this moment and it keeps these moments. I have this revelation over and over and over again where I'm like, 
fuck, I've had it easy. Like got, you know, I've been doing some activism here um, in Vancouver around trying to deplatform a quote unquote gender identity debate event happening at our university, um, which is not, not a debate because it's for people who all really, really agree with each other. And what they agree is that trans women are not women and should not be allowed to use women's bathrooms and should okay. not have, le- you know, human rights legal defenses as women. Like, you know, and the four of them all agree. So they're just going to debate, I guess, how great they think it is being <laughs> shitheads. Anyway. Okay. was doing a lot of organizing around trying to get this event canceled. But, you know, just brick wall after brick wall, abuse online, attacking emails, like all of this shit, you know, unfolding over a couple of weeks was so just like, fuck, this is so hard. Like, I'm so tired by this all the time. And I was like, this is two weeks and I can stop whenever I want. Trans women don't get to stop. I was like, and those moments where I just come back to being like, oh yeah, okay, this is the way in which my privilege is working within my life on a regular basis, is the fact that I can opt in and out of these experiences. And when I am tired, I can say, no, I'm done now. And go back to settling into an identity that people aren't policing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I resonate with that so much. You know, I do feel obligated and I work very, very hard to try to do things that I think are good for the planet. Um, and then like yesterday, I, I, I hit a wall and then I, I watched Buffy, the vampire slayer for like two or hours, you know, but like that was my hard moment. Like, oh, I have to watch Buffy now, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> I'm so tired. I got to watch Buffy now. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, I, yeah, my, my life is, is constantly, uh, constantly having those moments. Um, I'm curious what your, how you relate to the concept of self-care or how you think about it. Um, because obviously it's very important to take care of ourselves. We have to take care of other people. Um, and is there like a kind of I feel like this discourse is embedded in certain communities and I'm wondering if you have mm-hmm. any thoughts on that. Yeah, I do. I do. I self-care is really central to the project of secret feminist agenda in general. Um, and I also know that self-care is very often depoliticized and let's say like seized upon by capitalism as a way of depoliticizing us being like, mm, take some time, have a bath. Don't, Buy some bath salts. <laughs> Buy some bath salts. And whatever you do, don't disrupt the status quo. You should be too busy having a bath. But the the way of thinking about self-care that has been helpful for me very much links back to that um, disability justice and thinking about the sustainability of, um, of what Sarah Ahmed calls living a feminist life. She's got at the end of that book, which is just my current go to it's right here beside me I read it and reread it and reread it and she has this um uh killjoy survival kit at the end and that killjoy survival kit is the best description of self-care I have ever read because Mm -hmm. for one thing I love that rephrasing in terms of survival what do you need to survive this hard hard world and we need all kinds of things and some of the things that we need to survive is doing the work that makes this world survivable. Like that's part of it, right? Sometimes self-care for me is agitation. It is protest. It is activism because that's making the world more livable for me. And sometimes self-care is looking at myself and saying like, you need to stop and rest because you're going to burn out. Mm -hmm. And if you burn out, you are good to nobody. The world is not served by you're working yourself into an early grave. Like it's not, that's not a useful, you're contributing nothing. Um, So, so thinking about that in terms of um, sustainability, in terms of like, what does it look like for me to build a sustainable life on multiple different levels, right? Like how can I live in the world in a way that is sustainable for me and that is sustainable for the land that I am also living on and the communities that I am moving through, like, what, if we all prioritize sustainability, like sometimes for me, that's going to be being like, no, I am, I am out for a whole week. Yeah. This past June, I think I took this, I mean, this is 
whatever, academics need to take more time off. But I took this entire week that was like, not, you know, a vacation off with friends. Not, if it was just like a week of nothing. Like a week of like, I'm not planning anything. I'm not seeing anybody. I'm not doing anything. I need to be, like, I have to tap out because I have used up. And I actually would like my own personal working on sustainability is like, I would like to catch before I get to that point, before I get to the point where I'm like, I need to be a human burrito for a week. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, that, that thinking has been really helpful for me, that self-care is a whole variety of things. Mm-hmm. That includes like doing groceries, making yourself food, sure. cleaning your apartment. That like, it includes those things. And then it also includes saying no, staying home, right. hugging a cat going out with your friends, having fun, doing the work that needs to be done. Like it's this whole mix of things and it's all about, you know, creating around you a world, you know, in which we can all be cared for. Sure. Yeah. I, I just, I personally, like, I feel, I feel guilt or like what I I feel like it's a big privilege again to be like, all right, I'm going to watch Buffy, you know, like that's, that's something that comes with my very easy life. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also, I don't know what are you going to do? I guess you have to, I guess you have to take care. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to end capitalism or white supremacy by not watching Buffy for two hours, (laughs) right? Like you're not, you're not like, it doesn't serve anybody to beat yourself up. And actually what it does is perpetuate this model in this which, cycle, yeah. yeah, right. So, so that guilt, I think for me, for me, those moments of guilt, which I absolutely share in those moments of guilt come from, um, one, absolutely the sort of ingrained workaholism, like I am as valuable as I am productive. Sure. And it also comes from this, like, well, if I never stop working, maybe white supremacy is not real. Like, it's like, well, but I won't be part of the problem if I'm just exhausted all the time. And it's like, we can't, we can't actually hard work our way out of systemic oppression. Like, yeah, that's, real, that's what I'm, that's what, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's a real like neoliberal trap, right? Like, <laughs> like that, that idea that I, an individual through my hard work will write the world. And it's like, no, we will change systems through united work right through collectives Mm -hmm. through collective resistance through like we've got to um uh my friend Zena also previous guest on secret feminist agenda talks about this in terms of systems change that we need to think about systems change and systems change is um slow sustained work that is done in collectives um and so recognizing that like we are we are all in a big system that we are trying to figure out how to shift and that work is going to be slow. It's not going to happen overnight, which means that if I, if I am going to tap out for an evening, PS, I tap out every evening. I don't work in the evenings unless there's like an absolute, I've been working this week in the evenings and I've been like, Oh, this is outrageous. What's going on? I have, <laughs> right. I have great British bake off to watch. What are we doing? I mean, it's like, that's not, that's not a failure. That's like, you know, the world that I live in. The other thing that my friend Bart often reminds me of is that we are trying to change the world not so that nobody gets rest or pleasure, but so that everybody can have rest and pleasure. So like, deny, say, saying that rest and pleasure are bad is, is not how we're going to build a world in which everyone can have it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to take a a couple of snippets of what you just said and like add them to the end of that woman who speaks to me in a very soothing voice for 10 minutes on my meditation app at the end of the day. (laughs) Just write it on a sticky and put it on a mirror. It's hard things to remember. It's mm -hmm. hard for all kinds of reasons, including I think when you are really looking at the reality of how fucking broken the world is in so many ways that it feels so urgent and so on fire that it's like, well, I got, like, I have to, I have to go and do and ah, like, what do I, but it's like, we're not, 
we're not going to fix it by running around in a circle screaming. Yeah. Yeah. Even if sometimes it feels like the only response. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to let you go because it's time. That yeah, was, I think, a, a nice note to end on. Um, is there anything you want to impart? Any final wisdom or injunctions or what have you before you go? Oh. No, you don't have to. No. You know, read, read, read more books by disabled women of color. Go do that. Have you re- Hey, hey, listeners, have you read a book by a disabled woman of color recently? If not, go do that. Do you have one you would recommend? I mean, I would start with care work. Get your hands on care work. Um, it is a pretty brain exploding, exploding book. And Leah is an incredible writer who writes in an extremely, it's not a scholarly book. Like everybody cool. can read this. Yeah, that's great. And approach all new ideas as new ideas, you know, who are just friendly and probing you. Yep. Yeah. That's that's basically my job here on this podcast is just to be like, these are ideas. Hold yeah. them. Let let's see how they feel. Um spend some time with them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, cool. So people can find your podcast, Secret Feminist Agenda. Is there anywhere else they should be looking for you? I mean, I'm on Twitter a lot at HKP McGregor. That's okay. My much to my the detriment of my well being. <laughs> but that's where I am. I'm on Instagram, so it's I, in worse, in my opinion. Some <laughs> oh my God. They're all bad. <laughs> right, yeah. um, okay, great. And I'll put links to all that in the show notes so y'all can cool. find it. Everybody knows where to find me. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for tuning in. And thank you, Hannah. This has been lovely. It has been great. Thank you. Thank you.